want to share this with you. Um, I always have a message before a message. How many here remember hearing and some probably good teachers that say this, but I'm a, I'm a person that loves to kick over sacred cows. Everyone go, moo. What do you mean kick over? Kick over doctrines that are really not scriptural. Okay? All right. So, for example, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Does that sound scriptural? No. So what we have to define it. So the Lord gives us our salvation, but does he take it back from us? No. no. Nor can you lose it. You have to give it up. You can't just lose your salvation by being a silly boy or girl. You, you have to give it up and renounce it. That's why there's such an argument over once saved, always saved. It isn't once saved, always saved. It's follow Jesus and you won't have to be concerned about it. <laughs> Hello, amen. So let me let me go over this one sacred cow. People teach that when when people pray and they're really seeking God as they pray, sometimes God sends it back the answer and it comes by the hand of it. Now listen to this. I'm just hamming it up. Comes by the hand of an angel and he battles his way in and finally gives that to Daniel. How many here remember reading this story? Daniel prayed. And he asked God for deliverance out of the, the Babylonian captivity. And it says when he prayed that God heard him the very day that he prayed and sent the answer back with the angel. Right? Here's what I want to share with you. We don't have to wait 21 days when we pray. Hello? Because Jesus gave us an instruction for us to see what happens when we do pray. He said in John 16, in that day, the day that I go to be with the Father, the day that the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, the day where the new covenant comes into operation, you will ask me personally nothing. But whatever you ask my Father in my name, he will give it to you. Ask that your joy be made full so that you can have a full life. Say amen. Amen. So what happens, Pastor Kerry, when we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, we capsulate our prayer in Christ. Let me ask you something. Can Satan get through Christ? No. no. So when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, and you start praying, you literally come under the dome of God's protection. Satan can't hear your prayers. He's literally blacked out. And when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, it's literally sent by the fires of God in Jesus' name and returned by the fires of God in Jesus' name. So the Bible says, when we go before the throne of God, believe that you received it and you shall have it. It says, if you begin to pray, God gives you the petitions that you shall ask, 1 John 5. Are you with me? So a lot of people have got this mixed up stuff. If you think God could turn on you or turn on you at any moment, can you have faith for him? No. Exactly. Satan's a master at lacing religious thought within the truth. Hello? Anybody here this morning? So say... So, Pray your prayers in Jesus' name, not because of Jesus, not in your name, Lord, in your name, Lord. It, it's gracious, but it has no power in it. We pray in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus is the highest name, the powerfulest name that ever could be named, not only in heaven, earth, but under the earth. Why did he say under the earth? Because Satan's under the earth too. He's a snaggletooth. <laughs> when God says of the dust of the ground, you're going to eat. He was eating all right. Are you, are you with me? We got our scripture up there? All right. Ephesians 4. We're going to be talking about this morning, transformed into his image. Being transformed into his image. 
You see, a lot of times, we're going to read this in just a second, a lot of times we have what we think is God's will for our life. And that's okay, because we got to start somewhere. But how many know that sometimes what God wants is not necessarily how, how it could, come on now, but remember, you are his child. You're not a sinner saved by grace anymore. You are his child. He lives in you. So the way he relates to a child of God is much different than a sinner or in the Old Testament. He relates to you like, come on now. Come on. I could see myself a little, you know, do you remember the binkies? Do they still have those? Where the little sucky thing that you put in your mouth, you know? Come on, laugh at me. Pacifier. I, I called them binkies. You know, hey, get your binky now. My, my, kid, my kids are watching too. So anyway, so the idea behind that is there are a lot of Christians who still got binkies there. Okay, do you understand? And they don't know how to take the word of God. And, and what I'm saying is, is also a lot of congregations cannot be corrected. Did you know that? They sit there and if they don't like the pastor, they just fire them. <laughs> I love it here because you can't fire me. <laughs> I did, I, Linda and I are doing this by the grace of our heart. We're not looking to build a church or to have an edifice or have a great name. I'm not looking to hobnob with famous people. Now, I'm, I'm saying this for the reason. I'm here to give you what I know and then get out of here. Look at me. God didn't train me for 45 years in intense training just to sit around and my wife and I retire somewhere off in la-la land. Not at all. The church has been scattered for 20 years, 20 years of confusion, picking on one another. They don't know whether to worship on a Saturday or Sunday. They haven't got any clue. They're up, down, arguing about everything. And that's why there's no power in the church. So God said in the last day, I'm going to raise up standards that are based and built around my word in the love of God, who are taught how to wear the armor and use the weaponry that I work so hard to die in, in hell and go come back to life to give you. Now, God sent his son to hell and back for us to learn that we are free and we have great things. Can you say amen? All right, here's our scripture. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. See, if you're a pastor, you better be able to teach. Otherwise, you're really not a pastor. Hello? <laughs> and listen, one other quick thing. Teachers, not all teachers are pastors. Hello? But I will tell you, all apostles have all the other gifts, prophet, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They're able to do that when they start a church because apostles are church starters. Then there's prophets, blueprint givers, and then there are evangelists. Go out on the streets and com compel them to come in. And then some are pastors like me and teachers. Can you say amen? What does he have those in the body of Christ for? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ. And look at verse 13, till we all come into the what? I mean, are the church unified in the Northwest yet? Nope. We still got work to do. All the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God unto a what? The word perfect there is teleos, which means Mature, to come completeness or maturity, okay? All right. And unto a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of? God wants us to come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He wants you looking like Jesus. Go get your sandals. <laughs> he wants you looking like God, acting like God, speaking like God. Great thing for you to study. I mean, just for fun. Go to the chosen, the series, the chosen, and watch what Jesus, how Jesus moves amongst the people. The church has lost that finesse. We need to learn to work with God's people and make them feel special. Make them feel like they want to know the God that you serve. Say amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. Okay. Pitch yourself on the cheek. No, don't do that. All right. So good morning to you. God wants us. So here's what our, it's transforming. We're transforming into his image. Amen. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to look at the first three verses. I got my morning breakfast here. 
Yeah, steak and eggs. <laughs> Although that does sound good, doesn't it? Okay, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who in various ways and in various times spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his what? Son. Back in the Old Testament, listen carefully, I'm not putting anything down. But in the Old Testament, God was in the planet very limited. Why do you say that? Because who did Adam give this planet to? Satan. Come on. And Satan offered it back to Jesus in his temptations. All these kingdoms I'll give you, for they were delivered unto me. So Satan owned this planet in the Old Testament. God came here by invitation. Now, you, you're going to have to really, if you haven't been taught this, you're missing out on a big chunk of understanding of the whole picture. So God was sort of outside the planning looking in, so he had to work with covenants with people. Adam and Eve already committed high treason. Cain already slew Abel. There was a real mess going on. People weren't calling on the name of the Lord till after the end of Genesis chapter 4. So but God had to, was outside looking in and he had to have somebody who was born in this planet to invite God back in. If I come to your door and I knock on your door, if I go into your house without any invitation to come in, I'm a thief and a robber. That's why Satan's called the thief and the robber. Okay. He came in on Adam's authority. He stole and usurped Adam's power. Adam was given this planet under God. Say amen. amen. Adam had the right. No, you might not know this. He had the power to literally frame his world with the words of his mouth. He was a God creature, a God type of creature. He wasn't a Mormon. <laughs> he didn't make people. But he's a God type creature. He talked to the animals. He was able to name them. All this. And Satan says, I've got to stop that immediately. See, so what you don't know is Lucifer, or split toe, Klingon, the dude, he was in the garden way before the creation of Adam and Eve. You'll find that in Ezekiel 38, Isaiah 14. And so he thought this planet was his. So he stole it back from Adam. That means his birthright. Now, that's why Jesus had to come and be born as a man. He had to be born as a man, take man's sin, die, and be risen from the dead, the firstborn, because no one, no one could leave this planet. We were in a prison. The only place that people who believed in God went to Abraham's bosom, still on the planet. But Jesus was the first one to break through the heavens, the firstborn from the dead. And he said there would be plenty more after it. Hi. Hi. Let's get the picture. Let's stop being religious. Let's get the picture. The picture is now Satan has been replaced by Jesus. Adam gave his authority to the enemy, and Jesus came and got it back. Say amen. Now, you need to know that all power, Jesus said in Matthew 28, is given unto me. How much? How much? Well, you've got to believe it. You've got to act like it. That means the all-powerful one lives in you. So why are you going from the in outside in still on what you see and what you hear instead of walking with the man who creates and changes everything? Say amen. Say amen, everybody. You're blessed. You are very blessed. Okay, so let's, we just begin to get into this. So various times, various seasons, God spoke by the prophets and by, by the law, right? Okay, and when Jesus was transfigured and went up into the mountain, who showed up to talk with him besides God? The law and the prophets. Yeah, Moses and Elijah, they're heroes, they're heroes. Let's make three tabernacles, let's be religious. No, 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 no. Cloud overshadows them out there, and I'll leave. we're going to read it here in a minute. And God says, no, this is my beloved son, you pay attention to him. He's the one I gave you to be the example, the cornerstone for you to model your life after. Everyone say Amen. All right, so let's finish Hebrews, and it goes on, it says, who being, talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the impressed 
impressed image of his person, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Say amen. He is in full authority. When you, you, are you trying to tell me God's got everything in control? No. I'm trying to tell you if you put your life in his hands, now he's got, got a hold of you. We have to put the world back into God's hands. See, Jesus paid the price, stripped the devil, got the world back, and then he turned right around and gave it to the church. He gave it to the church. It, they didn't give it to the world. He gave it to the church. So the church is responsible for the condition of this world. Oh my gosh, that's heavy. Only he will let until he be taken out of the way. That's the church, not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's never lifted off the planet. During, even during the tribulation, he works in... How do people get saved in the tribulation without the Holy Spirit? So he's not yanked off the earth. The church is yanked off the earth. And your heavenly father, you are his child. Do you think God's going to stick you right up with the Antichrist so that you could be a better child of God? That's yeah, such bad teaching, and it's all over the Northwest. We're probably going to go through the tribulation because you never know what God's going to do. I do. He's going to be my loving Heavenly Father. He's going to protect me at every right. He sent Jesus to hell and back so I may have a life. And you too. Now, what are we doing with that life? Are we being religious with it? Unfaithful, not showing up at church? Have we let God's house go without care? While you go to your own houses and build your own lives? Of course not. You're not that way at all. See, man, everybody. Here's four things we're going to cover today. Everyone go, you're kidding. I thought we already had church. We're, we're going to cover that. Listen, you get the word here. We give you the word because the rest of the week, I don't know what you're getting. Hopefully, you're getting into the word, you're praying, and you're doing it. But, you know, most Christians, they got enough faith to keep themselves out of hell but not get victory. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. Amen. Blessings to you, family. We love you. Okay, four things. Number one, spiritual transformation in Jesus Christ. We're going to cover that. Two, transformed into the same image, Christ, not what we think God is. Say amen. Three, we're going to talk about briefly the image of Christ is seared in us. Did you know when you got born again, God seared an image, a blueprint in your spirit? God's right here. You have the mind of Christ right in your spirit. The trouble is we're not reaching down here and pulling it out. We're reaching up here and getting all messed up. I'm pointing to my head, okay? I'm, I'm just a praying for you. I like to do that because it's so odd and silly, yet people do it all the time. Boy, I spent an hour in prayer. You did? How did you do that? Well, I just dwelt on God. No, that's meditation. That's okay. God hears the meditation. But when you voice, you're covenanted. You're speaking power. Believe in the heart, confess with the mouth. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, not the brain. <laughs> That's why, remember, Adam had the power to frame his world? That's why Satan is working so hard on Christians, because usually we're talking the problem and not the solution. We're framing our world full of problems by talking about it. Don't you think God's aware of every problem there is? He needs you to ask for the solution. You have not because you... Yeah. And then finally, for Jesus Christ, the, God, the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen to me. I'm not, gonna, I'm not weird. I don't think we're the only ones that know the truth. I, are you kidding? But the church has been missing the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you where that pure gospel is. I'm going to show you what it was given for so that you may enjoy it. The pure gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of the kingdom of God or heaven. 
And when we receive the word, he's building the kingdom within us and around us. We're actually framing our world. Now, if your world is a disaster and your life is still a mess, you need to be talking and speaking the right things, blessing the right people, say amen, and avoid speaking the obvious. Boy, that was sure terrible. Why do we speak the obvious? Because it takes no brains. I'll sip to that. <laughs> you guys got plenty of brains. See, you got to learn to laugh. A lot of people take things so seriously. It, don't do that. Take it seriously enough for God, but don't think I'm barking at you. Can you say I'm not? I'm just trying to show you all the crazy things I went through. All right, so let's go. First thing, spiritual transformation. Go with me to Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at Jesus' transformation real quickly. All right, Luke chapter 9, we're going to pick up at verse 28. It says, Now it came to pass after eight days, after these sayings, he, Jesus, took Peter, John, and James and went up to a mountain to pray. What did he go to do? Jesus always prayed every day, first thing to his Father. Are you better than Jesus? Well, then you better get started. Hello. Two. Okay. As he prayed, the appearance, I love this. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. Just like Moses when he was up on the Mount of Transfiguration. On the first Pentecost, Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments. Then finally at the Pentecost after the re resurrection of Jesus Christ, we get the New Testament. Can you say amen? The law versus grace. Ha! Huh? You want grace? Then get it with his face. Amen. So let's go on. So he goes on further and it says, and it says, his face was altered, and his, and his robes were glistening, verse 30. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah. What do they represent? The law and the prophets. You're going to see that all through the, the Testaments, all through the Old Testament. Law and prophets, law and prophets. It's okay. Okay, but it's no longer the law and prophets. It's the Son. Let's go on. So he says, and Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke to his um, deceased, spoke of his deceased that he was going to die, and which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. 32, but Peter and those that were with him were heavy with sleep. Remember when the anointing's there, if you're in the flesh, you're going to get sleepy. Your flesh is a sleepy creature. Creature, creature. And then when you really want to sleep, you can't. Isn't that something? Aren't you know who's messing? He can't touch you, but you got to put him in his place. You get your hands off my mind, off my property, off my family, and you have to declare it. Remember, we're taking back the land that Adam lost, that Jesus got back, but says, you have to do something. We don't see all things put under his feet. Why? Because our job is to put things under defeat. Everyone say defeat. The left one and the right one. There you go. I started that a long time ago. You say, how do you know you started that? Because God told me. No, I'm just joking. Isn't that silly? I go in these subways. All right, so look at this. It goes on further to say this. And but Peter and those that were with him were heavy asleep, and they, and when they were awake, they saw the glory and two men that stood by him. Then it happened as they were leaving, or um, uh, what is that word? Parting. Parting from him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we be here. Here comes the religion. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. And when he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful. It was a fearful place. And as he entered the cloud, a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. What was the father saying? 
I don't want you caught up in the Old Testament. I want you caught up in all these things. I want you focusing on my son. He's the shepherd. He's the one that's going to lead you out. So simple. Can you say amen? Now, why does God liken this unto sheep? Anybody want to answer that? <laughs> Thank you. You said that. We're sort of missing a few bricks in the flow there. Sheep are interesting. They're very loyal, very loving. Goats are not. Goats are with the sheep. Hello? Now, I'm not picking. I'm not saying any of your goats or anything. But sheep, here's how smart they are. They get close to a water that's raging and bubbling, which they won't. The shepherd won't let them do that. But if they ever get close to water and, and they don't get sheared on a regular basis, their coat will get into the water and all that water will soak right up the coat and they'll just pull them right over and they'll drown. That's pretty intelligent. <laughs> If we don't get with our shepherd and let him guide our life, you're going to, Satan is going to work something out to try to snuff you early. I mean, are you aware of that? I, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Are you aware that many of you have been close to death a couple of times and God saved you? Maybe you didn't know it. Nine times for me, because I was in drugs, I was doing all of this kind of, that. I came very close to death. One time, I was leaving my body, and God says, no. Now, that was before I was saved. And now I know why he did that. Hey, I got something for you, Carrie. How about that? Ah, not me, Lord. <laughs> Pick on Scott. <laughs> Scott, I don't know what that is, but amen. So here we go, a couple of points. Number one, now Jesus was about to show them the new covenant. Let me explain the new covenant. You see, all other covenants that were made before Jesus Christ's death and resurrection all had flaws. Say flaws. You know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. A covenant is a chain of connecting. Amen. When you cut a covenant, it means to cut where blood flows. So, Abraham in Genesis, I think we're on the 13th or the 14th chapter, talks about how God the Father and God the Son came down in a smoking flax and burning furnace, and Abraham was asleep, and, and he says, now Abraham, we've cut this covenant, would you like in it? And so Abraham had to wake up and to believe in that covenant. God cut a covenant for us. How many know that man's the weakest link? Yeah. So God can't make a direct covenant with man because it will always break it. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. It's the truth. So Jesus came to stand for man. He all man, all God, and, and bled to death and cut a covenant. That covenant's forever settled in heaven. Cannot be broken. You can't destroy it. If you fail tomorrow, it wouldn't touch it. Satan can't get near it. It's your covenant. The problem is, is not being taught in the church. We base all of our prayers, all of our walk, all of our love for God based on that covenant. Woo! Which means Almighty God is obligated himself to back you and protect you as long as you're behaving and walking in the spirit. You say, why do good things happen to good people? Because the good people probably have a lot of secret openings. They're allowing the openings of the devil to come in. The idea is we meet with God daily so he can fix those openings. Didn't Job have a lot of openings? An unfaithful wife, children in rebellion, partying all the time. He was fearful about this, fearful about that, fearful that. He was Mr. Fear. Put a big old F on his, his chest. Yet God says to the devil, have you, have you looked at Job? There's none like him in all the earth. You know, I can't touch him. You got a hedge about him. Read it. God did not turn Job over to the devil. Job turned himself over there by his fear and his worry, his talking all negative. Look at the conversation. Did you know Job is talking to Moses about this book? He's talking about nine months of his life, terrible hell on earth, and he's talking to Moses because Moses is writing these things down. 
You guys didn't realize that, but I like to study. And so here's, he's just confessing all of his problems. What happens at the end? He puts his hand over his mouth and he says, I've uttered things without knowledge before God. He, I repent, Lord. When he did, God gave twice as much. See, God always loves his children. You understand? It's the devil saying, oh, God's doing this to you. God's doing this to you. God's making it hard just to see where your faith is. Folks, God lives in you. He doesn't need to see where your faith is. <laughs> well, what about that? I don't want to get on this. I kicked over enough sacred cows. Let's move on. Okay, so we see that the law points to Christ. Points to man, you can't save yourself. You need a Messiah. You need Christ, okay? Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's look at this. Verse uh, 3 through 6. Still on the first point, we're going to move to the second real quickly. But even if our gospel is hidden or veiled, it is veiled or hidden to those that are perishing. Hello? Do you understand that? People that don't hear the gospel have no hope. We need to share. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to save you. Jesus wants to be in your heart. Hello. Jesus is not mad at you anymore. He wants you to come and accept him so he can clean you up and he receives his child home. Remember the prodigal son that returned home. Remember the heart of the father. And the religious fella, his brother, Jews. They were the Jews. Jews are always looking down their nose to the Gentiles, which they call dogs. <laughs> Sorry to teach you about it. But see, Jews aren't bad people. Not at all. They're lovely. I've been to Israel. I love them and a wonderful spirit pill once. But the Jew Jews, back at the time of Jesus, what did they do to Jesus? They were so in tune with the spirit. They killed him. Don't be a, a Jewish Jesus killer. Remember, there's two of you. Say, there's a Cain and there's an Abel. This is where Christians don't even get this. First story about murder is Cain killed Abel, right? Say hello to your flesh. Its name is Cain. Say hello to your spirit with God in it. Say Abel. You say, Cain always wants to shut down Abel, but your spirit is always able if you let God lead you. And people don't know that. That's a story in the beginning of beginnings, how that evil tries to snuff out good. It's never changed. And even in your flesh, when because of sin in our flesh, that Paul says, there's not one good thing in my flesh. Anybody that walks around in their flesh, don't get their flesh to the natural man. Don't get them mixed up. Flesh is one thing, natural man's another. But he that is in the flesh, the Bible says, you cannot please God. I don't care if you build a hospital in the flesh. You will get a dip ziddle of any credit for it because you did it for yourself and not for God. Hello? You're getting a full meal deal here. <laughs> Let's go on. All right, so it goes on. And whom the God of this world, okay? So do not be, uh, said those that do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image. Remember, we're trained, transformed through the word, through meeting with God in prayer, into the image of the likeness of God. Who is the image God should shine on them. You see, Satan blinds people's eyes, blinds them to the truth, and gives them religion instead. For we do not preach ourself religion, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the what? In the what? You've got to have a face-to-face -face relationship with God. Not, Lord, I ain't you, thank you, God. No, sit down and talk to him like I'm talking to you face and face. Amen. Talk to him that way. Because, see, here's another thing. When you say Father in Jesus' name, you're not no longer in this planet. 
you're also before the throne of God. Hello? And so nothing like the Old Testament at all. They had to wait for God to come to them. No, God takes us to him. If you can imagine, I don't know if you have a computer, you work well, all that. If you can imagine, I'm just a poor illustration. But when you're looking for something and everything, you hit the little button and it brings right that little clip right on up. When you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, here you come right up before the throne. Can Satan go there? Yeah. How come a lot of people think on the side of the head that when they're praying, Satan's listening in? <laughs> Are you, that's because of religious teaching. Satan can't. Once you say Father in Jesus' name, he can't hear you anymore. It's when we open our mouth and start talking against that that he starts picking up on us. Remember what I shared about the armor. The armor is light. The armor is Jesus Christ comes over you. So when you get up from prayer, Satan doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. We're covered in light, so we're blinding him, so he starts to back away. You've got to see these pictures because this is what the Word says. Not religion. The Word says that. And he backs off because God is light and in him is no darkness to it. Respond to it. Hey, let's just pull his finger off his hand so he can't pull it. Can you say amen? All right, are you with me? So when you're in the Old Testament all the time reading, there's going to be a blinder come up over your head. Hello? Why? Because that covenant, now listen carefully, is fulfilled. It fell short of the one we are in now. So when we try to operate from the actions of the old covenant, it only goes as far as about here. But when we come through Jesus, I mean, heaven's completely open to you. So do not bring yourself, bring Jesus to him. When you got Jesus in your heart, he came in seed form. Everyone say seed form. Amen. What's the first thing a seed does? The old part of it cracks off and the new part comes out. God put an entire package of life and all of its godliness inside of you in Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's all in seed package in your spirit. Okay? And if you don't believe me, read 1 John 3 and 1 John 5. And if you, once you take the God in you and you go to the God that's over you, the seed germinates, the seed develops in you and cr till Christ is formed in you. That's why young baby Christians, we need young Christians. I'm, I'm praying God give us seasoned people, not to control, but to help us. We're going to, a huge flock of people are coming. I can feel it in my spirit. And we're going to need to be ready and trained. Can you say amen? So that seed inside of us has got to develop. It's got to really develop. And the only way we grow and develop, folks, is not by doing. That's a work. By being with God, he develops us inside. Then what he develops, we take out and do. We read the word of God, and then we take it into him, and he shows us the true meaning and brings it alive, and then we take it out and we preach it because it's living. Amen. Not some dead thing I'm reading off a page. Hello. All right, let's go through the rest of these points. Second point, we're transformed into the same image. God doesn't want us to be anything else. Can you say amen? But like Christ. So go with me to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And here Paul says, I beseech you. I beseech you, really almost begging. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, your spirit man, your spirit man, present your body a living sacrifice. Who is to present your body to God? You are. What do you mean? You, when you first go to meet with God, I like to tell everybody, before you even put your feet on the ground, say hi to God. You wake up, you got sleep all over, you drool, say, hey, God, and then go from there because you're letting him know he's first, he's your love, you see? And then and you go to God, and the first thing you need to do is when you come to God, say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I lay my flesh at your altar, pervade it, press it, zap it, cleanse it, and everything like that, so that when I leave your presence, it will serve me and not itself. 
Did you hear what I said? If you don't do that, your body will start wanting to serve itself. Hello? That extra piece of pie? Snacking at night when you know you shouldn't? I'm just kidding with you, but still. So your flesh is actually an entity of itself. It is your slave. So don't let your slave tell you what to do. Don't let the tail wag the dog. Roof. Roof. Don't let your tail wag your, wag your life. Can you say amen? Are you getting blessed? I, I hope you guys are. I sure love you with all my heart. So anyway. All right. So we're being transformed. So be not conformed to this world. Okay? All right? So it says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. See, the only way your body can be acceptable is if you present it to the Lord. He'll press it, he'll zap it, and cleanse it, which is your reasonable service. Not a good translation there. It's required to serve God. The reasonable service literally means you are required to do something with your flesh to effectively serve God which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, be you transformed by the what? The renewing of your mind that you may, now listen, prove. How many know you got to prove without a shadow of doubt? You see, when I preach the gospel, it's not words. There's power there. That means that if any of you have a need and you really need it bad, you come up here, you're going to get your need met. Okay? But I very, now listen, I very seldom call for altar calls because sometimes people come up for their self and for attention. So I teach people how to get it right where they're sitting. So you don't wear the pastors out and play the game. I believe in altar calls. I believe in, I've given them thousands of come down in the mission field and everything. But that, I believe in that. But we can do that where you're seated. Can you say Amen. Amen. If I can get you with the words of my mouth to see the right kind of pictures, then your faith is going to come alive because it is substance of the things of the pictures that are the hope for. And all of a sudden, God starts to bring you alive into those revelations that I'm teaching. Why? Because before maybe it was hidden, now it is revealed. If you know where you're going, you can walk there because God is helping you walk. And you say, Amen. All right, so be not conformed by, the, by this world, but be transformed, transfigured, metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. You're like a, a caterpillar, huh? And you're in a cocoon, your flesh. Hello, everybody. And as you begin to walk with God, your cocoon begins to crack off, and you begin to turn into a beautiful new creation in Christ. But folks, there's a little time between the cocoon breaking off and you flowering out. Hello? So what do we end up doing? We end up, you're going to laugh at this, this is my illustration. You're going to end up preaching at people from inside your cocoon. And it's going to look real fleshy. <laughs> Hello? Amen. Come on, laugh with me. People don't need to see me up here. They need to hear God. Can you say amen? But if I was so out of order, all they could do is see me, then I'm yelling from my cocoon. <laughs> Every day when you go in to meet with God, rip that cocoon off and begin to just bathe and soak in the presence of God. He's the one that grows you into the butterfly. He's the one that grows you into that new creature. You don't develop going out there in the field. Working hard and trying to get those victories. Listen to me, I'm not putting any of that down. But sometimes it just takes a little tweaking and to get you to be in the cart instead of pushing the cart. Anybody here? Aren't you trying to push things along a little bit, trying to get God to hurry up? Come on, don't look at me in that tone of voice. Sure we are. I do that. I find myself being in a hurry when I don't have to be. 
You ever find that, that, that inside of you? Don't let that happen. Hello? Walk in peace. Walk in rest. You can beat the tar out of the devil and not lose any sleep. Because you're not doing it. You're releasing the one who's done it. All I have to do, says, Father, in Jesus' name, that little snugger tooth is starting to harass your people. And God will say, what do you want me to do about it? Because we have to give God invitation, folks. God doesn't take it upon himself to do things. If that was so, you would have been saved a long time ago. <laughs> you had to invite him in. All right. Say transformed. So God got, has to get you in the word and then in prayer. Has to get you in the word and then in prayer so that he can show you what your faith is working for. So that you don't get in the way. He can move you out of the way. You take what you know in the word and bring it to in prayer. And then all of a sudden God begins to teach you. Opens the eyes of your understanding. Begins to give you revelation. Do you know now when I pray, I actually go to the places I'm praying? What do you mean? Are you astral purpose? <laughs> no. <laughs> when I say Father name Jean, I say, Lord, I, I'm lifting up Seth. And Lord, I'm asking you to help him on the job. I actually go to where he's working and in his job. And I, I, I start praying for him. Now, most people never get that far in their walk to experience that. But it's all through the book of Acts. All through the book of Acts. And vision and stuff like that. We serve a very supernatural God. He's not religious at all. So if you've got any religion, ask God to get rid of it. It's a placebo. All right. So we're being transformed in his image. And it says to me, we may know what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Everyone say good, acceptable, perfect will. So a person that examines, go to God, and God works in their life, they can prove what is good. What is acceptable and what is perfect in the will of God. So when I first got saved, I found out what's acceptable. <laughs> and what wasn't. Hello? Yeah, let me just, you can laugh at me. I was growing marijuana for the church. <laughs> I mean, when I first got saved, I didn't know any better. And then, then finally I knew better. But you see, God smiled at that. He didn't think I was a, a nasty person. He was just glad he's got my attention. See, we always make God into some kind of legalist. I'm going to smite you. No, I got rid of all that and everything. And we're talking years and years, 47 years ago or something. I mean, so God gets us out of those kind of things and changes our thinking. We begin to see the way things really are. And that takes time. Say amen. So we are being transformed into the same image. We're being transformed into the same image. Say amen. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 through 18. My word, Pastor Kerry. Again, this is not a 20-minute sermon, burp you, get your money, and, and send you home. Okay? I've been in a lot of churches like that, and, and they're wonderful, but if you want to go anywhere, you really have to get with God. Say amen. You can't just listen about God all the time. Amen. It's good to be with God's people, especially if everything's moving and grooving. But listen, I don't want, I want to be people that start moving and grooving, not follow everybody else's moving and grooving. People want to be a part of something that's happening, but they don't want to work in the kitchen to make it happen. Say, oh, me. Get in the kitchen and start work. Watch what God can do. I probably, in my little lifetime, have planted 16 churches over in the Philippines, which I didn't really do. Just sent them a PA system, and they built all the churches, and they called them all Joy Lord Fellowships. That was the old name of the church. Down in Haiti, there was 10 churches there started all in the, in the Haiti area. People are hungry. You understand? You don't control a church. You don't own a church. You, you might be able to one of those people that starts churches or helps build churches. Amen. So let's look at this, okay? 2 Corinthians 3, 16 says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, when one gets born again, 
That veil, that hiddenness, the scriptures are suddenly revealed to you. That veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Everyone say, even though I can, should I? You have a freedom to do anything, including sin. But should you? Yeah, just because you can doesn't mean you should. All right. That's where self-control comes in. Let's go on. And it goes on further and it says, Now where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, everyone say, we all, all. with an unveiled face, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are being, see it's in in progression, you're being transitioned, or you're being transformed. Formed into the same image from glory to glory. So the church is supposed to be focusing on who? Jesus Christ. You can't just say God because none of you have seen God the Father. Nobody. We can get an eye of the Father through Jesus. Now, I don't, I'm not oneness, okay? I believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But if you get a picture, the Father's never left his throne. He's always sat there. That's his authority. He's above all, through all, and in us all. Jesus is always that active person in the Old Testament. He was the angel of the Lord. And by the way, whether you agree with this or not, he was Melchizedek, the prince of Salem, with neither parents nor upbringing, genealogy. Who is that? Jesus coming as a priest. And when you read the book of Hebrews, he doesn't liken unto the priesthood as unto Aaron, man's priesthood, but unto Melchizedek, the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And so people are scared to say that. Oh, you might be wrong. I I live with God every day. God's never wrong. You live with God every day. Look, if I look at you, it doesn't mean I'm preaching at you, okay? (laughs) You live with God every day. How come you don't know these things? Say, I do. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I don't want you to be kicking something you don't wear. I mean, if the, I'm pitching a shoe out there, if it doesn't fit you, don't put it on. <laughs> if I say something that, you know, oh, yeah, man, yeah, then all of a sudden you think, is he talking about me? Come on, fleshy. No, I'm not. I'm preaching, preaching. Catch it, catch it. Okay, all right, let's go on. How many here know that God's great plans for us? So say I'm being transformed into the image of Christ. I'm under construction. So here, let me, let me, let me share you. Get your eyes off of people. I don't want you looking at me as I'm special. Please don't do it. That's a good way to kill a pastor. I'm nothing. I'm a sheep. You're better than I am. How about that? You are actually better than I am. God says that I die daily so that you may live. Hello. And if you've been in the ministry, listen, we do all of us carry about in our bodies the wounds and the hurts and the pains. A testimony against those who do such things, but a testimony for you, for the goodness of God, that we would lay down our life and love you that much. Pray for pastors and ministers like that. Are you with me? So the image of Christ has been seared in our heart. Romans 8, 29 and 30, real quickly, and then I want to get to the gospel of Jesus. Romans 8, 29 and 30 says, For whom he foreknew, that's you and I, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. Say, that's me. You see, Ephesians 1, verse 5 says, God predestined us to be before him in love, but Adam blew it. And now God came back to get that. Hello. I don't believe in predestination the way it's taught. God has a great plan for us, but it's up to us to get with God to fulfill it. Can you say amen? Whether you do or not, you'll have to answer for it. Guaranteed. Everybody will confess their fault and bow their knee to the glory of God. So let's do it now. Amen. And so it says like that, to whom we foreknow, we predestinate, be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestinated, these he also called, hey, he called you guys. Whom he called, those he also justified, and whom he justified, that's he also glorified. 
you are his glorified child. Think about it. Your father doesn't want anybody messing with you, including me. I'm never going to play head games. I'm not a manipulator from the pulpit. My job isn't to counsel you from the pulpit. My job is to give you the word of God, pray for you, and hope that you'll get it and see the change in our hearts. Say amen. To commend you to the word and to prayer. All right. Colossians 1, 16 through 17 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, and principalities, and powers. All things were created through him and for him, and without him was not anything created that was created. The Father thought it. Jesus started moving the word. He spoke the word. And the Holy Spirit brought it to pass. All three working in harmony. And the word became flesh. So now it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The begotten Son came when Jesus was born as a man. He wasn't always the Son of God in heaven. He was the Word in heaven. Three that we reckon in heaven, Father, the... Boy, you guys. Word and the Holy Spirit. All right, moving right on. Go with me, Mark, and we'll finish with this. He's going to finish. It's amazing. Okay, Mark chapter 4, please. We're going we're to show you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, folks, some of the stuff that we hear out there, I'm not going to rail on anything, is not the gospel. There are people, I hear revival fires. Now listen, revival fires are going out all over the land. They're starting in colleges and all kinds of things, just like God to pull something out of nothing. And there are people that are, say they're Christians coming against God. Now that shows you how screwball-y they can be. The Bible says don't ever talk against another child of God, even if there's plenty to do. I mean, even if they're, because they're God's property and they're God's business, the moment we start criticizing, we open the door for our own judgment. And everyone say it's not a pretty thing. Say it's not a pretty thing. It's a dreadful thing. That's why anybody that moves prophetically and moves in the realms of the spirit, their mouth is the first thing they get in operation. Hello? Gosh, it reminds me of this guy. I have a couple minutes with you. Reminds me of this guy. It's time for church. He's in bed. He doesn't want to go to church. And his mom's screaming at him. Son, it's time for you to get up and go to church. I don't want to go to church, Mom. They love you at that church. They don't love me at the church. They're always, you know, I, I, you know I'm just not accepted at church. He says, you know, Mom. He says, no, you need to get up and go to the church. I said, well, Notice I said, I said, it's not, I said. It. And he says, tell me one good reason I need to go to church. And he says, you're the pastor. <laughs> Hello. So here's the gospel of the kingdom. There's a lot of people out there preaching something, but it isn't the gospel. Because number one, God doesn't tear down his body. He builds it up. God always exhort, comforts, and edifies. That's his fingerprint. Write this down. Exhort, comforts, and edifies. Satan can't copy that. He can exhort you, but he can't comfort you. See, there's a fingerprint of God. If you want to read, hear any sermon, any, any clip, anything, you put that fingerprint on it. Okay? Because if it's not done like that, it's a counterfeit or man's idea. All right, here's the gospel of Jesus. In verse up, chapter, uh, verse 4, chapter 10, or verse 10, <laughs> chapter 4, verse 10, sorry. But when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. This is the parable of the sower. This is how all of the kingdom is built. Your words build the kingdom around you. If your words are talking to the dust of this earth all the time, you won't have much of it but a cabin. <laughs> you won't have much at all. We have to talk the word to build the kingdom. All right, so 
And so it says, and he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mysteries, the hidden teachings of the kingdom of God, but to those outside, not saved, all those things come in parables. So that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear but not understand, lest they should turn and repent and their sins should be forgiven. He's talking about the Jews. Then he says in verse 13, then he said to them, do you not understand the parable? And then how will you understand all of the parables? Because they're built on what Jesus is about to say, how the kingdom is built on the word. His gospel is the gospel of kingdom. So I'm not going to read that whole thing because I'm, I, I want to just share with you. My pastor years and years ago, way before there were cars, okay, he told us you always line the scripture up. When you hear it, when you see people preaching it, that you line it up with Christ. If Jesus didn't say it, Jesus didn't do it, Jesus didn't operate that way, Jesus didn't function that way, then something else is working, usually man's religion. So Jesus becomes our eyeglasses. Hello, that we look at the Old Testament and we look at the New Testament. By the way, when did the New Testament come into operation? When Jesus rose from the dead and then Pentecost, the kingdom of heaven came, right? But let me ask you, so until Jesus died and rose again, he was in what testament? That's right. So when he's talking, he's still in the Old Testament. That's why he relates a little differently. He says, but in that day, when I go home to be with God, when I send you the Holy Spirit, when the covenant comes, that day, things are going to be different. You're no longer going to beg me for things. You're just going to ask the Father in Jesus' name and thank me for them before you ever see them and they will come. Did you hear that, Sherry? Why does God do that? Well, well, Scott, God has a word for you. He says, I have a great future. And, and now you're in the valley of making sure what you choose to do and how you do it is of me, saith God. For I will prosper you above measure above measure like I showed you if you continue to allow me to guide your steps. Can you do that? Does that bear witness with you? Amen. And for you, sister, God wants me to know that your timing, you're into, no, this is really hard, so please throw me out. God says timing is everything with you because he has to move a lot of things out here so that he can move you where he needs you to be. Not that you're not doing the will of God right now because you are. But he says there's a timing coming real short. It could be even now. It could be even you being here to create a change, whatever it is. But God says you're going to see thousands. You're going to be preaching to thousands. But to not despise a small beginning. Do not despise a small beginning. Okay, and the Lord says I'm, you're not going to pastor, but you're going to help many a pastor. Okay. Okay, doesn't mean you won't pastor type, but what I see is you're more of an evangelist teacher and you're kind of above just pastoring. Okay, it's what I see. It's a good thing. Yeah, apostolic call. Okay, and there are a lot of apostles in this area that don't know they're apostles. They're church starters. They speak prophetically like a prophet and they're called watchers. Watcher, I put watchers on the wall. They will not cease praying day and night. They see when the enemy's coming, they see what to do. See, a, a pastor is a type of watcher because I have the eyes to see where this church is going. I have the ears to hear what God is saying about to us. Amen. And besides that, I'm the mouth. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Come on, laugh, brother. Wrinkles are gathering on your... Amen. So everything that you do, you got to use Jesus to be your filter. Can you say amen? And I know that expression, Did, would Jesus do that? That was the basic idea. But you need to bring it through the filter, okay? The filter is Jesus Christ. How did he do things? 
The people in the, in the book of Acts. I always tell people, if you're brand new, read the book of John, get to know Jesus. Because if you see Jesus, you know the Father. You know the Holy Spirit. And then said, go to the book of Acts and watch Jesus working through the believers. And then put yourself in their place. Silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, I give you. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I give you the word. I give you the power that comes in my heart. And same, that's what you give away. You don't give away your charm. <laughs> you give away the Lord. All right, if you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord praise? Amen.